This is the first in a short series of videos about the mathematics of epidemics and pandemics. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at how we can model epidemics and pandemics. A few quick definitions before we get started. So pandemics are the worldwide outbreaks of infectious disease, like COVID-19 that we've seen at the moment. Mathematical models essentially use lots of different mathematical concepts to describe real world phenomena. So for example, we can use mathematics to model what the spread of a pandemic looks like. In particular, we can understand how different factors, such as properties of the population in question or the infection in question, contribute to the spread of the pandemic, including the speed of how it spreads, the total size of the pandemic, etc. If we can understand how different factors contribute to the spread of a pandemic, we can work out which policies to put in place to prevent the spread and limit damage. For example, mathematical models can tell us the impact of social distancing, vaccination programmes or the introduction of strict hygiene measures. There are an absolute tonne of different models you can use to model pandemics and epidemics. Some of them are hugely complex, so we're going to use a really, really simple one today. It's of the model type SIR model. In an SIR model, we assume there are three different groups in the population at any point in time. So there are individuals who are not yet infected with the disease, they've not been infected yet, they're not immune, so they're susceptible to being infected. Then we've got individuals with the disease, they're infected and infectious, they can pass it on to other people, so they can pass it on to the susceptible. And the third group is our removed individuals, so this is individuals who have had the disease and are no longer infectious, and they cannot catch the disease again. There are a whole bunch of different questions we might want to ask ourselves about modelling pandemics. How many uninfected people do the infected infect? How long are the infected infectious for? What does the spread of pandemics look like? And how many people will be infected in a pandemic? As well as many, many more. In this video, I'm going to focus on the first two. This is the groundwork for future videos in which we'll answer the other questions. So the first question we're asking ourselves is how many uninfected people do the infected infect? So we're just going to focus on two groups to answer this, the susceptible individuals and the infected individuals. There's two big questions we want to answer here. Firstly, if an infected person interacts with an uninfected person, what is the chance that they infect them? And secondly, how many uninfected people is the infected person coming into contact to in a given time period? Let's say a week. I'm going to build this model up piece by piece. So at the start of the pandemic, we're going to assume there's just one infected person who has the disease. And this infected person is interacting with a whole number of uninfected people. When an infected person interacts with an uninfected person, there's two possible outcomes, right? Either the uninfected person is infected or they're not infected. You can't be somewhere in between. The probability of each of these outcomes must be between 0% and 100%. Let's call it k% percent, where k just represents any number between 0 and 100, so it could be 40%, 20%, 10%. In reality, k depends on a huge number of different factors, so the type of interaction, the different people involved, etc. For simplicity in this model, I'm going to assume that in every single interaction, there's exactly the same likelihood that the infected person infects the uninfected person. Let's move on to the second question now. How many uninfected people is the infected person coming into contact with in a given time period? Unfortunately, the infected person is probably interacting with lots of different uninfected people, especially because with a lot of diseases, you're infectious before you get symptoms. In each of these interactions, there's a K% percent chance that the infected person infects the uninfected person. I watched a great video by Professor Tom Britton, I'll put a link down below, and he said that we should imagine it's like tossing a coin. So when you toss a coin, you know you're either going to get heads or tails, with a given probability. For tossing a coin, it's 50% heads, 50% tails. Let's imagine it's the same, but with a disease. When you interact, you're either going to infect or not infect. So essentially, you're tossing that coin with every member of the population that you interact with. So say you're interacting with Alice and Ben. The chance that you infect Alice is totally independent of whether or not you've infected Ben in your interaction with him. Let's make this really simple and assume that our infected person interacts exactly once with a given percentage, let's say X percentage, of the uninfected population during a given time period. On average, the infected person will infect K% of the uninfected people they interact with, like we said before. 
So our infected person interacts with X percentage of the population and with those X percentage of the population, it infects K percent of them. So our first infected person infects X percent times K percent of the uninfected population. I'm going to make this a bit more real. Let's throw in some actual numbers so that this makes a lot more sense. Let's assume that the population is 401 people. The average person interacts with 10% of the population in a week. And the chance that the infected person infects someone in any given interaction is 5%. So if this image here is our uninfected population of 40 people, on average in a week, our infected person is going to interact with 10% of that population. So that's 40 people. So the people that are at risk are now in orange. Of the 40 people that our infected person is interacting with, only about 5% of them will actually get infected under the assumptions of the model we've made. So two people, those two people in red, are the only people that our infected person is going to infect this week. You can see the maths written out here. So 400 people at risk times 10% people being interacted with times 5% chance of infection in an interaction is two people. It's worth noting that this is only an average. It's quite possible for the infected person to infect fewer people or more people. They could be a massive social butterfly out there, out everywhere, infecting people left, right and centre, or could be a hermit and infect nobody. This brings us on to the second question that we want to answer in this video. So how long are our infected people infectious for? The second piece of information that we're going to want to plug into our model is how long the infected are infectious for. That is, when you've got the disease and able to pass it on, like our red people here, how long are you actually able to pass the disease on for? We can assume that an infected person isn't going to keep infecting uninfected people forever. Eventually, they're going to be removed from the disease. Let's assume this happens in one of two ways. They either become immune or they die. In both of these situations, we're now assuming they can either give or get the disease ever again. You can definitely build much more exciting models where people could get the disease again in the future. But that's beyond the scope of these videos. The time it takes for an infected person to be removed from the disease obviously depends on the disease in question, also on the individual in question, but we're going to assume that it's the same for everyone across the population, for simplicity, and we're going to assume that someone is infected for t weeks on average, where t is a positive number. It could be one week, two weeks, any number of weeks. Why do we care how long someone's infectious for? Well, we care because the longer someone's infectious, the more people they're likely to infect. In our earlier example, we calculated that the average first infected person would infect two people per week. If our infected person is infectious for more weeks, then they're likely to infect more people who will, in turn, probably go on to infect more and more other people. So pandemics spread faster if people are infectious for longer periods of time. That's the end of part one. We've laid out the basics of the model we're going to use in the future videos. The next one should be way more exciting. It's about the start of the pandemic. So when the infectious disease hits, how does it spread and what does that look like?